Welcome to Crime Most French, a fortnightly podcast covering intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Researched and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open the van and let the mayhem commence. The case this week is the Christian Ranucci affair. Christian Ranucci was accused of abducting and killing Marie Dolores Rambla in 1974. He will be the second last person to be executed in France. But doubts still exist on his guilt. Oh, oh no. On the 3rd of June 1974, between 11.05 and 11.20, because 11.20 is the time <clears throat> when Marie Dolores Rambla's dad came home, so we know it happened before that point. Mm-hmm. Marie Dolores, who's eight at the time, is abducted in front of her home in Marseille. She was living in the high rise. Okay, so that explains why, because it's obviously because it's a kid that uh, the guy obviously yes. Was yes. shortened. Yeah, the only executions um, from the fifties on were either kid murderers or treason. Okay, I think that's the only two cases, right? That uh, that were executed. She's outside playing with her brother, mm-hmm. Jean-Baptiste, who's six. At the time, that was normal, because we're, we're talking 70s. So oh, yeah. kids go out, play on their own, when the parents are away. Yeah. That was normal. Yeah. A grey car parks near the garages nearby, not far from where the kids are playing. Mm-hmm. And a man comes out of the car and comes to talk to the kids. Uh-oh. After explaining, explaining that he lost his black dog... He asked Jean-Baptiste to go and look for it and asked Marie Dolores to stay with him also to look for the dog. Jean-Baptiste goes round the building looking for the dog and when he comes back to his starting point, there's no sister, no man, no car. Oh, God. She's gone. Look, uh, can I also probably add, I don't think there was a dog. Well, we don't know, but most likely no. So he runs around, tries to find any trace of his sister and when he doesn't find her he goes back home to his dad Mm -hmm. and his dad contacts the police at 1 15 p.m right so the whole safety and numbers thing doesn't necessarily work uh, uh, four and what is it a a six years old a six-year-old and an eight-year-old easy to trick them to separate them well especially in the 70s Mm. they hadn't had the stranger Stranger danger Danger campaigns yet Mm. On the 3rd of June, so that is on the same day, mm-hmm. between 12.15 and 12.30 p.m., Vincent Martinez and his fiancée drive on the N96 from Aix-en-Provence to Toulon. Right. So southeast. That's yeah. where we are. Yeah, yeah. They drive in their white Renault 16. Again, I remember my grandfather had one of those. It wasn't white, it was silver, but he had one. I've been a lot in those cars. At a junction 20 kilometers from Marseille, they have an accident with a silver Peugeot 304 Coupe. Ah, uh, okay. That was driving down on the N8 bis and didn't stop at a stop sign. Because remember, they're N roads, so now mm. they would be double carriageways, but yeah. at the time they would barely be more than a countryside road. Yeah. Just a little bit wider. Or sometimes. So you had stop signs and you went through villages. Yeah. And when we went on holiday from Paris to my grandparents, half the trip would be on those roads mm. and we would go through dozens of villages. Yeah. Massive traffic jams. That would be a nightmare. But anyway, th- that was the road at the time. So they have an accident. The 304 was hit at the rear, does a spin, and then it flees towards Marseille. Vincent Martinez can't chase the 304 because... His car is damaged. Mm. He asks Anna Aubert, who was following him, who, who he didn't know, just happened to be a guy behind him, right. to try to f- follow that car. Mm-hmm. He drives a Renault 15. That was a sporty version of the, the Renault at the time. The Renault si. 15. Alain um, Aubert agrees, and he goes after the 304. He comes back a few minutes later with a reg number, having found the 304 on the side of the road about a kilometer away. Okay. Vincent has to rip out the front wing of his car to be able to move again. Right. So he does and then leaves. He takes the Enic Beast towards Marseille. Mm-hmm. That's the road that the 304 went. Right. 
but doesn't see the 304 anywhere on the way. So when the guy behind him came back and told him, I, f I found the car and here's the reg plate, that's not long after and the car is gone. So he continues until he, until he finds the gendarmerie station, the mm -hmm. nearest one, and he pressed charges at 1.15 p.m. Okay. The 304 is easily found. Uh, the reg plate is 1369SG06. And it's identified quickly as belonging to Vincent, uh, Christian Anchi. He's 20, he's a sales guy, and he lives in Nice. At about 5 p.m., in a mushroom farm, someone asked Mohamed Raoult for help freeing his car from mud on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. Mohamed and his boss, Henri Guazzone, there's lots of Italian-sounding names in the area, uh, because it was part of the Savoie duchy until the... 1870s, 1880s. Okay. So it was essentially Italy at the time. So mm -hmm. lots of Italian sounding names. Yeah. So they help him free the car um, and it goes away. So mm -hmm. they relate that story to the gendarmerie the next morning. So that explains where the car went then? It is a lot later. No. Oh, yes. It's several hours later. Yeah. So. So he crashed again then? He seems to have crashed again or got stuck in the mud more than crashed. Um, a few hours later. Would it be entirely outrageous to say, for Marseille drivers, that's not that unusual? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're crazy drivers. They're crazy drivers, yes. On the 4th of June 1974, the next day, the girl's abduction makes it to the news. Mm -hmm. And as a result, three witnesses having seen the 304 contact the gendarmerie. The first person is Henri. So that's the guy from the mushroom farm. Right. Who contacts the gendarmerie at around lunchtime. Mm hmm he tells how he helped the 304 get out of the mud the previous day with his tractor. At 3.15 p.m., Anna Aubert contacts Gendarmerie as well. So that's the guy who went to, to find the car. To look for the car, yeah. yeah. He relates the accident that he witnessed and how he saw a man run away from the car with something fairly large under his arm. The next day, on the 5th, the Gendarmerie continues looking for the little girl with more staff. Mm -hmm. On that day at about 10 a.m., Vincent Martinez contacts Gendarmerie. Having seen the news, he wondered if there could be a link between his accident, already reported, yeah. and the abduction, because it's very close. Mm -hmm. And also, they all mentioned that 304, and he had an accident with that 304. Yes. So he's wondering, could there be a link? As a oh, giant well. search organized with the gendarmerie, the army, search dogs, motorbike cops, and everything they could find right. in the area. Near the, mushroom f near the mushroom farm, the gendarmerie discovers a red jumper. Okay. The dogs pick up a scent, starting where the 304 had been stuck in the mud. Mm -hmm. And at 3.45 p.m., the gendarme discovers the body of a girl under some branches. She has bruises on the face, and her skull was crushed with stones. Oh, no. So she's dead. The gendarmes report it to the public prosecutor that instructs them to leave everything as is until the scientific police and the AME can arrive. Yeah. The gendarmerie in Nice is contacted to arrest Christian Ranucci, mm -hmm. owner of the car. Yeah. And at 6.30 p.m., he's reported arrested at his house. Right. At 7 p.m., Pierre Rambla, the father of the girl, mm -hmm. with prosecutor and gendarmerie, are on location, and he identifies his daughter's body. Poor guy. Poor little girl. The next day, during the autopsy, the Emmy discovers that the girl received also 15 knife wounds. Oh, no. So her, cru so her skull was crushed, but also she was stabbed. Poor little thing. Christian Renucci is officially only arrested because of his fleeing the scene from an accident yeah. at that point. Mm -hmm. As the tribunal in Marseille is in charge of the inquiry, the gendarmes from Marseille come up, pick him up, mm -hmm. and he's on his way to Marseille in a police car at 11 p.m. on that day. In the meantime, the gendarmerie goes back to the house, to his house, mm -hmm. and pick up his 304. They also pick up a number of items. They pick up a pair of trousers with blood stains, a knife, four leather straps, two hairs, one blonde and curly, looking nothing like the girl's hair, mm -hmm. and one that could possibly be okay. one of the girl's hair. Commissioner Alessandra, that's her name, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's her name, interrogates him as soon as he arrives in Marseille at about 1.20 p.m. a.m. the next day. Right. He's told that witnesses saw him after his accident flee with a kid. Okay. 
That was what was under the arm, presumably. Yes. Ranucci accepts that he was at the accident. He accepts that, yes, he fled the scene. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't recognize having been with a kid at the time. He says that he fled because he panicked. Because of the accident, he thought that he might lose his driving license and he needs it for work because he's a sales guy. So he drives around and sells whatever. Yeah. So he panicked and said, oh, if, I'm, if I have that accident and I'm responsible, then I'm going to lose my license and I'm going to lose my job. So he fled. Yeah, that's a bit unlikely, isn't it? I mean, it oh, that a... happens all the time. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. People don't think very far ahead. The interrogation ends at 2.30 on the 6th a.m. Mm-hmm. At 12 p.m., he is confronted to Marie Dolores' brother, the six-year-old, mm-hmm. and Eugène Spinelli, who is a garage mechanic. He owns his garage very close to the place where the girl lives. And he apparently witnessed the interaction between Marie Dolores near her house and a man. But neither of them recognize Christian Ranucci. Okay. So two witnesses, one of them a six-year-old, very, very close to the guy because he was talking to him. Mm -hmm. A mechanic not far, Mm. none of them recognize him. I mean, and that was kind of like within the previous... Yeah, that's a day or so later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's not like it was a long time later. No, 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 yeah, we we can't say they forgot because it was 30 years ago. It was actually the previous day Mm -hmm. or the day before. Okay. At 2.30, he's confronted to the Aubert couple. Remember the the people from the, the car behind? Okay, yeah. Who give chase to his car. And at that point, he cracks and confesses. I can't see how and why that would make him confess because these people just went after him because of the accident and somehow he starts confessing everything. It's kind of weird because mm. that couple had no link to the abduction whatsoever. They yeah. had no link to the body being found. No. I don't know. Just a link to him being an awful driver. Pretty much, yes. Yeah. That's it. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, at between 2 p.m. and 5 p.m., he gives details of the abduction and its location. He even draws a map, which is at the time the only incriminating element they have mm-hmm. that is not a confession. He explains that he used his knife to kill Marie Dolores and dispose of her body near the mushroom farm. Right. However, no witnesses around the girl's home recognize him and nobody can formally identify the car. Mm-hmm. So still, he confesses to things. He kind of provides evidence, but nobody recognized him. Nobody recognized him or his car. Is there any evidence kind of, of her being in the car? At the moment, no. Okay. At 5.30 p.m., the commissioner sends the gendarmerie back to the mushroom farm mm-hmm. to look for the knife because he said he killed the girl with the knife. Yeah. They find a knife covered in blood, belonging to the same blood type as Marie Dolores, mm-hmm. at 7.25 p.m., roughly where he said it would be. Okay. So spoilers, kind of that adds a bit of validity then. Yes, but spoilers, he has the same group as the girl. A, <laughs> right, okay. Group A. So it could very well be his blood on the knife. Yeah. We don't know. It just happens mm-hmm. to be the same as the girl's group. Ranucci is then transferred to the tribunal to meet the instructing judge Mm -hmm. and is formally arrested for abduction of a minor less than 15 years old, followed by voluntary homicide. Apparently that's a a very specific crime. Yeah. He lists all the facts of the case to him and in the room there are a few psychiatrists that will then examine him Mm -hmm. to determine if he's crazy dude or not. Yes. On Monday 24th of June 74... So we are talking a few days later now, quite a bit, really. That was the 3rd of June she was abducted. So then we went on the 24th of June. Okay, so, so three weeks later. So three weeks later. The instructing judge organizes a reenactment uh, on the various locations where things have happened. Okay. As the instructing judge wants to ask Renoshi questions, they travel together in the police van. They are joined by the judge's aide, where also Renoshi's lawyers. And the Parti Civil, remember I explained that uh, people can join prosecution against someone oh, yes, in, a, in a trial. So that, that usually covers 
Like in this case, it would be the parents mm -hmm. of the girl, but sometimes it could be neighbors, it could be well, whoever yes. decides they have an interest in it. So you can so enjoy it's, it. it's the state plus. Yes, if it's, you've called got a civil a part. it's called the civilian part. Mm -hmm. The party civil. For safety, Renucci is kept in the van when they reenact the abduction at mm -hmm. um, the high rise yeah. because the judge is worried that neighbors are going to want revenge. Yes. Renucci confirms that where. He abducted Marie Dolores mm -hmm. and which road he took to leave the area. And that is consistent where the place he had, with the place he had his accident. Because given the road he was traveling down, mm -hmm. he could have come from where he abducted the girl. So at the moment, everything matches. The next location is the accident. Again, they reenact the accident. On the way, he's asked to pinpoint where he stopped for a cigarette because apparently he stopped for right. a cigarette, he said. But he can't. He can't explain where he stopped, which is weird. So she's in the car and he stops for a cigarette. That is the story, yes. That sounds a bit weird. It does sound a bit weird, yes. So at the accident location, the judge got Ranucci's and Vincent's car, the actual car, mm -hmm. they brought them. And he asks both parties to explain what happened. He decides that Vincent's story, so the guy who was hit by the car, is the right one. Ranucci arrived at the junction at high speed and didn't stop. Ranucci doesn't agree with that. He says that he, he did stop, he drove, wasn't driving fast, and then he started again in second gear. Which, at the time, with the shitty cars of the 70s, starting from scratch in second gear was impossible. Yeah. But anyway, that's what he says. Yeah, so he, okay. he doesn't agree with the... The story of the accident. He mm -hmm. says, I'm not responsible for that accident. Then they move to the mushroom farm. The 304 is moved there as well. Mm -hmm. And placed where the Obia couple said they saw the car parked. Yeah. Ranushi denies it's the right location. And he's then brought to the exact location of the murder where the body was found. Mm -hmm. And there he has a panic attack and decides not to talk anymore. And he says, I didn't kill the girl. And that's it. Doesn't talk anymore. So he's now entirely recanting his story. Kind of, yes. Or well, he refuses to talk more about it. Okay. On the farm, he's brought where the knife was found, mm -hmm. which was a bit further from where the body was found. He recognizes the location. Photos are taken at all the locations yeah. on the farm. But none of them is showing, Renucci showing where the knife was found, which is, will later be used by the defense by, to say... You have no proof that he said that's where the knife was mm. because normally they take a photo of the murderer or whatever showing where yeah. the thing is and that shows that he knew where it was. Yeah. There's none of those photos in existence. So the only thing we have that says that he confessed to where the knife was mm. is the cop's word. That's it. Yeah, so that's they will use that in the, in the trial. A bit unfortunate. Yes. On the 15th of June... So a week or so earlier, mm -hmm. a call for witnesses is placed in local newspapers. And as a result, f five witnesses come forward to relate attempted or abductions mm -hmm. by Ranucci. So he seems to have done it before. Okay, so he's got a history of uh, trying to pick up. Yeah. The first one is yeah. Mat Pinek and her daughter Sandra, mm -hmm. who's 10. They say that they recognized the published photos of Christian Ranucci in the press mm -hmm. as the man who, at the end of 1973, followed Sandra and one of her friends on their way home. Marthe says that she intervened as the man was chasing the girls into the stairs to their flat. God. During the confrontation, Marthe and Sandra can't recognize him. They can't, they can't say this is definitely it's the definitely, guy who yeah. followed us and tried to catch us. Well, let's face it, they weren't exactly staring at his face. I mean, they were turned the no, other way and running for their lives. Still, but yeah, yes. but the woman who intervened doesn't recognize him either. No, okay. And she would have been yes. facing him. So they're saying that his hair was shorter and he had different glasses. That's mm -hmm. what I remember. And then she confirms that he had shorter hair at the time and different glasses because it was the end of his military service. Okay, So he right. kind of... Semi confesses to that. Yeah, right. But not quite. He just says that, yeah, I kind of looked differently, possibly the way they say mm -hmm. I looked. That's what he said. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's but a couple of years after. Oh, no, the year before. 
yeah. 73 years. Yes. So. Uh, well, a few months before, yes, six mm -hmm. months before. Yeah. The second abduction that is that comes out after the the press release mm -hmm. is the the case of Patrice Papalardo, again Italian name, mm -hmm. four and a half years old, who was abducted on the fifteenth of April nineteen seventy four. So we're talking two months earlier, on a car park. Charges had been brought at the time. For two hours, the, boys were, the boy was kept by an unknown man, then released without harm. The next day, the boy recognized the man in the street and alerted his father and his brother, who chased him but lost him. The father and brother recognized the person they chased in the published photos. Mm -hmm. They also recognized Ranucci during the confrontation. So that's the first people who actually recognize him from something before. Right. So overall, it feels like Renucci is a comeback. Yeah, so he certainly seems to be in an habitual yes. uh, And he's not completely unlikely to have killed a little girl. Yeah. Because he was kind of involved in those things. So that's where we are at the time. Mm -hmm. But likely doesn't mean definitely. That's not proof. No. That... Only shows that maybe he was involved mm -hmm. in something kind of similar before. Yeah. But he never killed anyone. He didn't even harm the boy he apparently abducted, mm -hmm. just kept him for two hours. So that's a big step to yes. abducting a girl and murdering her with a knife and stones in, on the head. Mm. On the 27th of December 1974, Vanucci is brought to the judge's office one last time for a recap of all the charges because they've the authorities have decided to try him. There, he recounts his confession completely. He says I, he didn't abduct and he didn't kill Marie de Reis. He still admits, however, that the bloody knife they found was his and that, the, that he took the gendarmerie to the spot where it was found. Mm -hmm. He admits to these two things, which makes no sense to me. No. Because if he says he didn't do it, how could it be his knife and how could he know where it would be? Mm. That's apparently what came out of the, that interview with the judge. At the point when the instructing judge is done, she, for some reason, decided not to talk to Marie de Rossi, de Rossi's brother. So her brother is never interviewed by the judge. The garage owner is never interviewed by the judge either. And I really can't understand why, because they are the two main witnesses of the yeah. adoption. That's weird. Yeah. Very, that just, very that's strange. Yeah. The case is turn, then transferred through the system to the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. He charges Renucci and calls him for trial, but requests a bunch of expert evaluations because the defense said he might be nuts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah. he's evaluated again, and the trial is scheduled for 9th and 10th of March 1976 in Aix-en-Provence. It opens with a very negative atmosphere. In large part due to the fact that there's another guy, Patrick Henry, very famous as well, who was just ar arrested for kid abduction and murder. <sighs> like we're talking days before. So there's two of them on the go? Yeah, or there's is more there? than two of them on the go. So before the trial starts, uh, the crowd is really Being for in blood. the mood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In the mood for some, some blood. Looking for a head on a spike. Yeah, exactly. Ranucci denies abduction and murder still. Mm hmm. And he blames the commissioner for his confession. He says that he was intimidated and tortured, which is not completely unlikely in the 70s. Mm. Unfortunately, the, during the trial, he gets lost in contradictions a bit and makes some weird statements. And at some point, he even looks arrogant. Okay. So, so that he, he play starts well to undermine himself completely then. Uh, yeah. On the 10th, the jury finds him guilty on all counts mm. and he's sentenced to death. On the 12th of March... Renucci's lawyer, lawyer's appeal, obviously, mm -hmm. yes. dramatically. All four motives they provide for the appeal are rejected by the tribunal. His lawyers then appeal to the president mm -hmm. of the Republic for pardon. pardon. Yeah. But on the 26th of July, 1976, he rejects it. That was Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. He said previously, unrelated in interviews, that he finds abductions of children the with the quasi certainty of death, absolutely abhorrent, and he would have no mercy for these people. Okay. Unlucky. Yeah. So the request isn't helped by the fact that there's another kid abduction and murder happening mm. at the same time. Yeah. 
70s were not a good period for being a kid. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, essentially, if he had pardoned him, then that would have been bad for his political career because yeah. the oh, yeah, people yeah. would not have been happy. Emotions do get stirred up when children oh, yeah. are involved. Yeah, so that's three in yeah. less than two years that are very famous. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, then, then there's yeah. no way he wasn't going no, to no. be shortened. So on the 28th of July, 1976, he's awakened early and notified of his execution. Mm-hmm. He refuses a last drink, apparently, and he refuses to talk to a priest, but he accepts a last cigarette. His lawyers read him a letter from his mom, and he's then guillotined at 4.13 a.m. It's all quite quick. Yes. Yeah, there's no very, very, very long appeal no. system like in the U.S. where no, you can no. be on death row for 20 years. <laughs> no. That's ridiculous. Either you have death row or you don't, but yeah. don't drag it for 20 years. But when he was executed, he was still proclaiming his innocence. Mm. After the execution in 1978, a writer, Gilles Perrault, publishes a book called The Red Jumper. Remember, the gendarmerie found yes. that red jumper. Uh-huh. Not far from the girl. Yes. It is then made into a film the year later. Mm-hmm. That's a very famous book and film. I haven't seen the film, but I remember the book when it came out, even though it was only four at the time, because it made so much noise in the news. The conclusion of the book is that Randall is innocent. That's why it made so much noise. Ah. Uh. Because there was a trial, the guy is dead, and then the book is saying it wasn't him. As a consequence of that book, three requests for a revision of the trial are introduced mm-hmm. in 1978, 1981, and 1990. They're all reject- rejected by the justice ministers at the time. Of course they are. Who wants to admit guilt? Well, who wants to admit that they fucked up, yes, yes, and killed someone who shouldn't have been? Once the consequence of the affair and the book is that it becomes one of the arguments for the abolition of the death penalty in France in 1981. Mm. Um, Robert Banater is the justice minister at the time who was just appointed in 81. Mm-hmm. He's not the one who said no to um, a pardon. Um, he was the one after that. He managed to push through the... I guess it would have been the Senate and the uh, main chamber um, for abolition of the death penalty. Mm-hmm. Two of his main arguments were that Ranucci's guilt is not entirely certain. It could have been a mistake. Mm-hmm. And you can't possibly kill people if you're not sure. And also, it has no deterrent value. No. If somebody is going to abduct a little girl and kill her, whether it's going to be no. killed possibly afterwards or not, makes no. absolutely no difference to him. Yeah, you're not thinking rationally when you're... Exactly. So he says, what is the point of the death penalty? It yeah. does absolutely nothing. All it does is introduces a very terminal thing yes. that could be done on a mistake. Yeah, something can't be reversed. Exactly. So that's how he manages to, to make it um, removed from the, the mm-hmm. French system. In the 80s and 90s, several books are published on the subject. So you have pro and Mm -hmm. against Ranucci books. And the debate continues decades after his death. Now, for for the doubts, I'm not going to list all the the evidence for his guilt, but there's a few things um, that kind of throw some doubt on his guilt. So, for example, there is confusion about the car that was seen by Marie Dolores' brother and a garage owner. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they seem to talk about a 304 coupe, and sometimes they seem to co- talk about a Simca 1100. Very common at the time. Yeah. The fact that the six-year-old might not make the difference, and I'm certain I was six in 1980, I would have made the difference between these two, car, uh, two cars. I could recognize cars from headlights at night when I was a kid. Mm. There's no way I would have confused these two cars. But anyway, even if you say the kid is only six, he could have yeah, confused but the car. The guy in the garage. The guy know. is a garage owner. His job <laughs> yes. all day is to deal with cars. Yeah. How can he not make the difference between these two cars who don't look alike at all? Mm. They're totally different. Yeah. So that kind of throws a little bit of a doubt because mm. if they're not sure about the car, how can he possibly be sure that it was him? Yeah. Th- that, that's one of the problems. Also, neither of the kid or the garage owner describe him as wearing glasses. Mm. He did. He couldn't be without his glasses. Right. So it's kind of weird. Yeah. It's like, it might not be his car, it might not be him. 
I mean, also, that's, and that's almost like saying, you know, missing someone wearing glasses is just like, you know, describing you without having a beard. It would just be yeah, weird. Yeah, exactly. Also, the red jumper that was found near the body doesn't have an owner. It wasn't Randall Cheese. Mm. And according to his mum, he hated red. So he would never have worn a red jumper. Oh, uh, it's not his size. Apparently, it's way too big for him. Right. So it's an adult jumper. I don't know, it's an head. adult jumper. Yeah. Yes. In, in my head, I thought it was a kid. It was yeah, I, I, I thought that too. Yeah. Um, for a while, but no, it, it's an adult jumper. Okay. So whose jumper is that? Yeah, it's a bit weird. What is that jumper doing there? Yeah. Also, there are lots of contradictions about that jumper. Mm-hmm. It is described later by the gendarmerie as being very dirty and lying in the in the mud. So it could have been there a long time. Yep. But the judge, who received the jumper on the day it was found, mm -hmm. describes him as a perfectly clean jumper. Right. So T Two different stories. Entirely. Two different stories. Is Two different jumpers. Yeah. Weird. That is very strange. Another thing is that there isn't a single fingerprint of the victim in Renucci's car. Meh. How would a 10-year-old girl in a car not leave a single print anywhere? Mm. That's impossible. So, was she in a car? Yeah. And if she wasn't in the car, what does it have to do with him? How could he have, mm. have abducted her and yes. killed her mm -hmm. if she never hit his car mm -hmm. and she was never in it? So that's also very strange because they find absolutely no evidence that, that she, was she was in ever his car there. at mm -hmm. all. Yeah. The statements of the Aubert and Martinez families, the couples, mm -hmm. um, also changed over time. When Anna Aubert contacted the gendarmerie on the 5th, he mentioned that he saw a man flee the 304 carrying a very large parcel. Later on, he said he recognized Gian Ranucci and that he was fleeing holding a kid, like a, having a kid in tow. Okay. So that, not something different. large under his arm. Well, in one case, the kid would have been dead. In the other case, the kid was running with him. Yeah. Which one is it? Yeah. And it, we're, we're, we're talking days afterwards. It's not yeah. something like it's 20 years later. Yeah. That's it's just barely a number of hours after he saw the thing happen. Yeah. It's the whole, How can we be confused? The whole fallibility of, of eyewitnesses is exactly. just, just a nightmare. Yeah. Also, the time of the murder was never established with certainty, mm -hmm. which is weird. That would be the first job the, yeah. the Emmy should do. Yes. But it was never done. So... We only have a very, very rough estimate. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't match Ranushi's table, that timetable. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem like he would have been that person. <laughs> Again, that makes no sense. Well, yeah, Somebody way didn't too do many doubts of, of when she died. Yeah. Yes. Mm. There's also a bunch of documents that the gendarmerie should have created that weren't created. <laughs> So there are reports, um, for example, of confrontation between the Aubert and uh, Ranucci that don't exist. So they got mm -hmm. witnesses at the police station trying to identify the murderer. No trace of it. So we don't really know what happened. And even though they, the gendarmes say that Aubert recognized Ranucci, they didn't write it down. That's weird. So... Did it really happen? Did he really recognize him? We can't possibly know because there's no, no physical proof no of it. No evidence of it, yeah. Some witnesses also say that the map created by Ranucci to show where the body was mm -hmm. matches absolutely perfectly a land registry map. Right. So it looks like it's been traced or something. Exactly. Mm. If you go to a location you don't know on yeah. foot... You kind of can yeah. make a map for it, yes. but it's not going. The, no, the scales, scales are going not to gonna be gonna wrong. Be right. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to be missing things. Yeah. That's an ap absolutely perfect map. He apparently even puts on the map things that he can't possibly have seen mm. from being on the ground. For example, he shows a low wall, which was behind the house for where he was from where he was supposed to be. <laughs> okay. On the map. He can't possibly have seen yeah. that, more, that wall through the house. So unless he's Superman with X-ray eyes. Exactly. Mm. So that map that is the main piece of evidence mm -hmm. showing that he's the one who was involved in the murder yeah. is kind of weird because it's too perfect. He can't, he can't have seen everything that he put on the map. Mm -hmm. What is that map? Did he actually draw that map? Yeah. He didn't, I don't think he talked about it 
he never said he didn't draw that map. Mm. But at the same time, he never confessed to have drawn it. No. So was he given the map and told trace that and no. put things there and there? Mm -hmm. We don't know. Also, a witness came forward when Renucci was in prison reporting that she was talked to in the street by a man wearing a red jumper pretending to look for her black dog. That testimony was never put into the prosecution file. So people say that it was a false witness. Yeah. But that testimony was also corroborated by other witnesses later on. Some other people have seen a guy with mm. a red jumper pretending to look for a, a black dog. But it doesn't fit in with the... Uh... It doesn't fit in with the story that the, yeah. the prosecutor wants to push. Mm, exactly. So it was totally ignored. Which wasn't investigated. It wasn't recorded. No. It just never happened. But if that's the case, that means that that red jumper and that guy looking for that pretend dog would have been to somebody completely different. Yeah. There are several documents that have also gone missing, possibly because they never existed. Mm. Um, it could be that they recorded that they existed later on, but yeah. didn't actually create them at the time. So that creates Very much holes. after the fact. Though. That creates holes in the story. Mm -hmm. So, for example, one of them is the fact that the jumper is described completely differently mm. depending on whether you look at the gendarmerie file yeah. or if you look at the prosecutor file or the judge file. They seem to have seen different jumpers. Yeah. So which one was right? Which one is a fake? I yeah. don't know, but clearly one is. Um, and finally, one of the last arguments for his innocence is there was never any motive established for the, the mm. abduction and the murder. There was no rape or sexual violence. It was just a murder. Also, Ranucci, who was examined by a psychiatrist and psychologists, was never diagnosed as being a pedophile right. during the trial. So why would he abduct a little yeah. girl and, and kill them for no reason? Mm. Nobody knows. There's really no reason for him to have done that. Yeah. And that's the Christian Ranucci affair. Yeah. And definitely a very prime example of why you should let the evidence create its own story rather than trying to create a story to fit somebody who you have in mind. 